privilege it is to be on this stage with you all. Um, you know, I, I wrote this book uh, really with two main convictions in mind, and one was that there's an incredible amount of energy and vitality in the music right now. Um, and I think, you know, what you all are doing is, is excellent testament to that, and what this festival is presenting is, you know, wonderful manifestation of that. The second conviction was that I didn't feel like I had seen that story told the way I wanted to see it told. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to read a very brief passage, and then I want to get right into conversation. But I, I should make one quick program note. Um, years ago, Robert Glasper told me about his first uh, proper recording session. And it was for a Terrence Blanchard album uh, called Bounce, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I said, well, what was, what was that like? He said, you know, I went in, I was kind of nervous, and, and Terrence had this thing, man. Um, he had like glasses out for everybody, and he, and he was like pouring Grey Goose, and, uh, <laughs> and like just like trying to make it as relaxed as possible, and like, yeah. you know. So to that end, um, all of you will see, um, <laughs> these, this is not water in these, in these little red. plastic glass, plastic cups, so please be, be aware. And I'll, a toast to, uh, to hey, all of you plan who are here. Plan changes. Yeah. <laughs> no strobe. There you go. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read this this brief. Uh, the you beginning. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the beginning of a chapter called the New Elders, uh -huh. um, and I think you'll see why I'm choosing this passage, um, and I'll try to be try to be brief because uh, we've got a lot to talk about. The New Elders. Danilo Perez was 35, a well-regarded Panamanian jazz pianist on the verge of a popular breakthrough as a band leader when he decided instead to open door number two. The choice came in the form of a coveted invitation. He was asked by Wayne Shorter, the eminent saxophonist and composer, to join a new quartet alongside the bassist John Patitucci and the drummer Brian Blade. There was no question that the group would be received with rapt attention given Shorter's luminous stature and the fact that he hadn't led a working band fitting this description, an acoustic quartet as in his storied post-bop output of the 60s, at any point in recent memory. Still, Perez had to give the matter some thought. This was in 2000, just as his own career was hitting a beautiful stride. He'd released several acclaimed albums in the 90s, including The Journey, a brilliant Latin jazz tapestry, and Panamunk, mm -hmm. a clever dalliance yeah. with Thelonious Monk. But his heroically ambitious new album, Motherland, represented a major leap forward. Offering an audacious, sophisticated vision of Pan-American musical dialogue, it featured no fewer than 17 contributors in the mix, most of whom joined Perez for a statement booking at the Bowery Ballroom that fall, which registered on every level as a triumph. Sharpening the issue, the album was widely acclaimed, appearing at the top of a year-end list in the New York Times. For Perez and many of the musicians in his circle, there was nothing but promise in the notion of taking Motherland farther, expanding its footprint in the world. The road looked wide and inviting, the destination clear. And besides, Perez had already put in the apprenticeship time that would seem necessary for his development as a jazz musician. During his early 20s, he'd worked extensively with the bebop patriarch Dizzy Gillespie, first in his United Nation Orchestra and then in the smaller combos with which the trumpeter made his final recordings. Gillespie was a humanist with a message of cultural oneness, which Perez took to heart. But he was also, to a large degree, a mentor and role model of the old school, intent on passing on guild-like knowledge of a practical sort. Perez had, come, had more recently come into contact with other important survivors of the bebop era. He and Patitucci made up two-thirds of the Roy Haynes trio, whose indefatigable leader was a drummer of Gillespie's generation and stature. A live album by this band was released on Verve only months before Motherland and hailed as a power move for Haynes and a vibrant example of intergenerational exchange. But as far as Perez was concerned, it was more of a blowing session than a body and mind immersion, not on the order of commitment that the Shorter gig would require. So, the decision to join the Wayne Shorter Quartet, as Perez later described it, represented a crossroads. And once he headed down that path, reassurances were slow in coming, despite the bond he had with Patitucci and Blade, who'd both appeared on Motherland. The concept that Shorter had for his quartet was related to the language of free improvisation, but not entirely aligned with its objectives. 
the band would take well-known compositions from Shorter's back catalog, like Footprints and Juju, and often abstract them almost to the point of unrecognizability through a process of hair-trigger interplay. Nothing about a given piece could be taken for granted. With every footfall, there was a chance of stepping on quicksand. Hmm. Tempos and tonal centers were endlessly subject to flux, and discursive volatility was the rule. Perez initially felt thrown into the deep end, as he recalled a decade into his tenure with the band. It was scary, to be honest, to live out all these new ideas, he said. And it was a shock, because with Motherland, I remember the standing ovations and the three encores. Then, to put myself into a situation where I had no idea what was happening, it felt like a dictation and ear training class. <laughs> I couldn't really judge it. Even when I listened back to a recording, I felt like an outsider. What is that? What key are we in? Shorter's affinity for elliptical whimsy was genuine, and Perez quickly realized that his usual practice regimen no longer made much sense. He took down a list of the movies that Shorter had recommended, some of them terrible sci-fi entertainments that he'd endure for the sake of one throwaway moment in a single scene. Perez also came up with his own version of Wayne Shorter wilderness training, gathering a stack of old Tom and Jerry cartoons and playing them in his study with the sound muted. He'd improvise to the antics on screen like a silent movie accompanist for two or three hours at a stretch. The idea was to learn how to twitch and pounce while still making sense at the piano, connecting one spasm of movement with graceful haste to the next. The band's first album was released in 2002 to clamorous acclaim, but the album, Foot Footprints Live, was a highlight reel, weaving together material from three different concerts the previous summer. In real-time performance, the band could be a bit more of a gamble. It held to a rigorously thorough standard of discovery, welcoming not only flashes of inspiration, but also irresolute pauses, stubborn quandaries, and heady longueurs. At its best, the band made this process feel intuitive, creating cycles of action and implication. At other times, it could seem like a plane circling endlessly overhead, waiting for a landing signal from air traffic control. Hmm. There was a learning curve for audiences as well as for the members of the band. One of the quartet's first concerts at the Spoleto Festival in Italy met with a conspicuous dearth of applause. Shaken by the response, Perez brought it up with Shorter after the show. Well, that used to happen with Miles, the boss replied brightly. I take it as a good sign. Uh, <laughs> so, exactly. I wanted to read that passage because when we talk about the new elders, this is an idea that I knew from the beginning that I wanted to address with this book. Um, Danilo, you could say, is now an elder of a sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrence, you've become an elder of a sort, and yet you also have all this amazing um, testimony about what it was to be in Art Blakey's band. Mm -hmm. and, and so the idea of mentorship um, is so vital, continues to be vital, mm -hmm. um, but it's changing. <clears throat> Yes. So I wanted to sort of start with that question of like, what does the idea of mentorship show us about the state of the music and how has that changed? Um, so I'll start with you, Terrence. Well, I, I, I think for me, um, I feel honored to be a part of this legacy. Um, it's, it's being on this side of it, it's an interesting um, experience because I'm constantly reflecting back to conversations with Billy Higgins or Art Blakey or Clark Terry and them constantly telling me enjoy it because it's fleeting you know um, and how I seem to have gotten to 56 seems like in two weeks <laughs> you know but the beautiful thing about it, though, is like, you know, sitting on having conversations with him is kind of freaky because now I'm on the other end of the conversation. And I understand now what Woody Shaw and Freddie Hubbard and all of those guys, Dizzy Gillespie, were trying to impart on me about enjoy this. You've done all of the work. You're still working hard. The most important thing to understand about this is that this music is here for something that's bigger than all of us. And you need to really be engaged in it from a holistic point of view, not from a point of view of I need to prove that I can play or I need to be a part of the scene. Forget all of that stuff. None of that really matters because the scene constantly changes. It constantly, it's always in flux. The most important thing is that 
you are out there being yourself because the best you is going to help heal somebody else's soul who vibrates with that music. Do you know what I mean? And we have to come to terms with that because I, I tell my students all the time, Elvin Baptiste, who was a, one of my mentors in Louisiana, you know, he told me something, man, that blew my mind, and I tell my students all the time. He says, you know, being an artist is the struggle between uh, being who you are versus who you want to be. And the example that I always use is that, man, nobody wanted to be Miles Davis more than me. Nobody. You know what I mean? I lived and breathed Miles Davis, man. And then when I met that dude, first thing I've said was, well, that shit ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, as soon as you meet him, you go, okay, well, now I see why his music sounds the way it does. Same thing with Wayne. Hmm. But the liberating thing about that is that those guys make you feel comfortable with you being you. That's why I'm not, a, I'm not a big believer in this whole notion of how people browbeat young musicians, try to browbeat them in the submission. I think that's a cowardly act, you know, in a lot of regards, because Dizzy Gillespie never did that to me, Miles Davis never did that to me, Freddie Hubbard, Clark Terry, Woody Shaw, the list is endless. I remember having a conversation with Herbie Hancock and him telling me, well, you have your own voice. And that was, man, and it was just like a fleeting thing. But for me, that was like a moment that it's still etched in my brain, like where he was sitting, where I was sitting, the room we were in. It's like a glowing thing that you can take out of your pocket when you need it, right? Dude, <laughs> man, it's, like, it's, it's and I have to take it out sometimes when I'm, you know, doubting my own self, you know, and I go, okay, Ruby, you remember what this guy said? Wayne did the same thing to me, you know? And I was just telling him backstage, man, I love his record. And I'm not saying that because he's in the room. I'm saying it because I forgot to reach out to him and tell him. You know what I mean? Because like Ambrose has a new record out. I love Ambrose's new record. Because the thing about it is, Art Blakey, when we left Art Blakey's band, I'm gonna shut up in a minute, but when we left Art Blakey's band, you know what the first thing he told me was? He says, I love what you guys have contributed, but we need to replace you because this needs to keep going. So when I look at him, when I, when I look at Roy, when I look at uh, Ambrose, and I look at all of the stuff that they're, they're doing, the one thing that you can constantly say about all of them is that we don't sound the same. And I love that. And that's the way it should be because there's no one way to skin this thing. I've learned from listening to his record. I meant to tell you backstage, if you hear something on my next record uh -huh. that kind of sounds like yours, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Man. But you understand what I mean? I do. You know, and it's a beautiful thing to be a part of because I see it as a constant thing. Because when I first got in the business, those guys were talking about Slam Stewart. They were, Art Blakey was talking to me about Pops. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because he had that, that he talked about Monk all the time. So now the, it's just moving generation by generation. And the thing that's cool about it now is that I love what they're bringing to the table. Who am I to sit down and say, you shouldn't do that. It should be this. No, that's crazy. Society moves on all the time. My trumpet teacher used to tell me, he says, you're never standing still. Because when you think you're standing still, the, move, the earth and the world is moving mm -hmm. forward. So you're actually moving backwards if you think you're standing still. Yeah. Well, I want to hear from Keon about sort of the experience of coming to the table as a trumpet player in the jazz tradition in this century. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
all the weight of precedent that you know that could be really heavy if you if you let it you know what what was that like for you and how do you think that might have been different than it was for for Terrence hmm. I guess first of all playing the instrument that we play it's no games <laughs> the, 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 the trumpet is very is yeah. very unforgiving if you play golf and you hit, hit the wrong clubs <laughs> you know it's very un, unforgiving the trumpet enough. is one of those things yeah, and you gotta almost yeah. pray that tonight will be a good night right. so you know that being said you know you're amongst the best you know you got ambrose you got sean jones then you yeah. got the grace you got skane you got mm -hmm. terrence and it's like okay where do you live where do you stand up mm -hmm. in this mix of people do I try to play like them? No, because they play the baddest shit ever. Mm -hmm. So I need to figure out what's my lane. What do, what do I have to say? What is my honesty? What is real to me? Mm -hmm. And how do I convey that? Um, you know, accepting my story, accepting, you know, the way I came up. Um, typically, most of the times, all of us have this same five-headed monster, which is, you know, you got Miles, you got Freddie, you got Clifford Brown, Clifford, yep. you got Lee. And and Dizzy and sure. Dizzy yep. and Louis Armstrong, yep. you know, and you got those people. Typically, five of them are the same. Now, how do we end up so different? Is the question that we all have to figure out and all have to believe. So I, you know, I I don't know. It's 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 the kind of thing to being honest with myself and saying, you know, I can't do what they do. I do what I do. You know, I sound the way I sound. I believe the way I believe, and that's okay. Um, whether my, um, like I grew up wishing, man, if I have the opportunity to play with Art Blakey, then he passed away. You know, if I have the opportunity to play with, um, who, who else had it? Um, uh, Elvin Jones, then he passed away. I have the opportunity to play with so-and-so, then they passed away. But I had the opportunity to play with Billy Harper, and that was okay. I had the opportunity to play, you know, to meet Charles Tolliver. You know, and that was okay. Mm -hmm. So I get as much as I can to try to keep the, the continuum going. Um, it's always um, interesting to figure out how to keep it going because you can get distracted, you can get turned off, you can, you know, lose all steam. You can be, you know, people can talk shit to you or, you know, and talk down to you and tell you, no, that's not really the way. But then you realize that, you know what, if you can just follow your way and keep going full steam ahead, you'll arrive at a place that is actually a statement that people can, you know, resonate with what your vision is. Mm -hmm. And the point is, you know, ultimately not being scared. This trumpet, this instrument, you know, is, is brutal. Like, it's, it's, it's brutal. It's like, I don't know, it's like a bunch of Jordans coming at you, you know, honestly. Um, every day, every day, every time you pick it up, every time you go sit in, you don't know who's, who's been shedding hard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's reality, you know. But then at the end of the day, what do you have to say that will live past the competition? What do you have to say that will live past the ego? What do you have, you know, that's, that's honest, that's truly yours? What can they not transcribe about what you do um, mm -hmm. is a reality of, you know, who I am as an artist, who I am as a trumpet player, and what I believe, um, ultimately. So, you know, growing up as a trumpet player, it's a process every day, yeah. trying to, you know, stay on the train, really. Um, I feel like you, you need some more of this, maybe. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> cool. Well, you know, Art Blake always used to say, you're playing a man. <laughs> you play a what? A man. Okay. He said, and if you don't play it, it'll play you.
um, Camilla, you are sandwiched by trumpet players, um, <laughs> and you you had a different experience, mm -hmm. um, not only as a, as a vocalist and a guitarist, but also coming from Santiago. Mm. Um, and so I wonder, how is this different for you, thinking about, you know, okay, I, I want to engage with the jazz tradition. Was there also for you a kind of reckoning with the past and saying, mm. you know, like, I need to figure out how I'm going to say what I want to say? Um, that's interesting to to hear you say, oh, what you were saying, because part of it totally resonated with uh, my process as well, even coming from, like, totally a different place, um, to, in the southern part of America, the continent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, for me, <clears throat> Growing up in Chile, I, I did grow up with a lot of different uh, influences, musical influences coming from everywhere and everything. And, and jazz, it has a niche there and, and it, it has a very uh, good, high quality scene, but it's very small. And so at the same time, if you're not um, confronted with <clears throat> jazz through your family, it's kind of hard to get, you know, to get it. Um, so I basically um, I did I, I went to I went to school there and everything was um, I came from other worlds more like kind of historically speaking it was like from the modern era to the past you know and in that sense it's kind of different obviously because I kind of started digging from the from you know like people that were famous in the 80s and 90s what were their influences, and then start like kind of researching that way. And um, so after, after learning uh, the tradition and, and, and kind of making this picture, I moved to New York, and um, then I went to the new school too, uh, which is... Uh, what year? And uh, you too. I did. Oh, wow. I was there from 2009 to okay. 2012. What about you? I was there a little bit before. Ah. Ah, okay. <laughs> 99. Okay. 90, okay. And um, so um, basically after living here for, from in New York for a few years and starting uh, to put yeah my music together, there was definitely this questioning, you know? <clears throat> and I think jazz and this music in general, um, it would ask a lot from yourself, you know? It does put you, you know, in a, kind of like in an existential um, questioning, you mm -hmm. know? Because you're constantly confronted with yourself, mm -hmm. your limitations, and your, your strengths as well. So mm -hmm. that was a really, it was, I mean, it is still, it never ends, and that's the beauty of it too. But it's a beautiful process to go through, you know, and to realize that the more, the more honest and more, I'd like to think of generous as well, you get with your giving to the music, the closest you get to like a personal expression, you know? And so with, yeah, kind of like bringing all this beautiful tradition that I love studying, listening, and also kind of looking at the same time into my own tradition from my country and also into my own likings, you know, like I love folklore music, but also I love rock, I love funk, I love soul, I love so many things, you know, and then to be just like embrace yourself, yeah. you know.
Well, you've perfectly teed up this next thing I want to talk about because um, the other reason I wanted to read that passage involving Danilo and Wayne is because a, so in my mind, the, the Art Blakey generation of jazz elders, they, you know, we looked to them as a kind of North Star mm -hmm. and we said like, you can set your coordinates by them, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. But we now have a generation of, of elders, you know, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, um, you know, the late Muhal Richard Abrams, you know, people like this who have already, like when they were young, they were breaking rules, mm -hmm. you know? And so mm -hmm. they're not looking to define anything you know, Camila, I know Pat Metheny chose you to be the music director for his NEA Jazz Masters mm -hmm. induction. Pat is another person who, who has mm -hmm. now sort of graduated into this stature of an elder. Mm -hmm. And what is Pat Metheny if not a, like, <laughs> style all over the place person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this is something I, I hear in all of your music, too, is this idea of, you know, why limit myself by genre, by style, by era? You know, I, I just want to follow my interest where it leads. And this strikes me as a, a, a really strong character of the moment we're in uh, and where the music has, has come. Mm -hmm. So I'm just throwing this out for all of you. Let's, okay. let's talk about that sort of uh, permeability and how that's, the way that that's expressed now is actually kind of new. I mean, I look at jazz per se as, as like, it's almost like the passport to your expression. It's not the end all be all because there's so much out here. So much music, there's hip hop, there's you know the classical you know, things that you listen to, there's gospel, there's everything. But jazz is like the first, for me, like the first you know, baseline as to this is what I speak. But that's not it though. Um, for me to make my statements, it takes all of these other realms to be able to, to make the statement that I want to make mm -hmm. ultimately. I, I, th I think when, when you start talking about w this issue, um, you're confronting uh, a couple of different worlds. Um, you're confronting that world that when I came along in the 80s was so fearful of jazz dying hmm. that they were, they were duty bound to uphold this music. So they were constantly recreating, you know, and paying homage to, you know, the great minds of the past, right? And that's okay, I don't have a problem with that, but we have to recognize that for what it is because the guys who they're paying homage to were renegades. They were on the cutting edge. And Wayne Shorter said something in an interview with Tavis Smiley, uh, my daughter put it on her sash for graduation. She was so moved by it. She says, jazz means I dare you. Hmm. And when I look at what's going on today, who's to say what's jazz and not jazz? I literally hate that argument. I hate it with a passion. Because then you start to boil it down to what is swing. Hmm. And then when you boil it down to swing, you say, well, you can boil it down to who plays above the beat, behind the beat. It gets, it gets crazy. Whereas the general public are the people who really decide when you think about it. You know what I mean? They decide by making their choice, mm -hmm. you know, about what it is they want to listen to. And people can sit back on their laurels and say, oh, but blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. One of the things that's been great about great music, great music touches souls. I'm a firm believer of that. You know, I've seen people come to my home who've never heard John Coltrane and listen to it and go, man, what is that? You know what I mean? Or Lester Boy and go, what is that? Hmm. You know, it, 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 it runs the gambit. So, you know, when I see what's going on with, with him and all of these young guys that are, bringing all of these elements in, I'm like, it makes sense, because guess what? We were the first generation that grew up listening to a lot of those things. I grew up with, with Paul Mofakadelic, Jimi Hendrix, you know, Led Zeppelin, Purple Haze, you know, uh, all of that stuff, all of the R&B stuff, as well as the classical music and the jazz like he was talking about. But when we hit the scene, it was either or. Wow. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like to see that, like, the, like that whole line being obliterated now is a cool thing for me, you know? And, and I know I get flack for it all the time, man, because trust me, some of my friends, we have arguments about this stuff, you know? Uh, but, but the thing that I take away from it is that you can't dictate to people what they feel. You just can't. You don't have to agree with it. You can have your position in it and your philosophy behind it, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, you know, people are feeling something from this. You know, they're getting something from it. And people go to music to be healed. People go to art to be swept away from all of the bullshit that they have to deal with on a daily basis. So why take that one thing that is so liberating for them and say, yeah, but that's not it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, don't, I don't believe in that. And, I, and, and the truth is in the pudding because it hasn't stopped the freight train. The freight train is still moving. People are still creating and still doing a lot of different things. And I think it's beautiful. You know, from, from like more of like an outsider perspective, you know, like growing up in Chile, like I do remember like listening to music and listening to improvised music and not necessarily um, classifying whether this is, um, you know, in a particular way or not, but feeling if it felt good, you know, you know, and it it felt that it was the right thing, you know, and and to put these limitations, it feels um, kind of too academic in a sense. And music, music, it's 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 like liquid in a sense, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when we talk about jazz, we're talking about so many different things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the need to to you know, kind of... Um, categorize it. Not categorize it, but more more like identify it so that it doesn't get lost. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, which, yeah, I guess it's important in a, yeah. in a historical way. Mm -hmm. But to stop the progression of it, I mean, it feels almost like anti... Jazz, jazz, you know, yeah. like every every great that you check out their history, they're always evolving, you yeah. know. Here's, here's the only thing that I'll say about that. The only thing, and it was the reason why I put together the E Collective. I just wish kids do their homework. Hmm. That's on, my only thing. My my thing is, don't cut yourself short because I'm as an educator, I'm always fascinated by, wow, if this kid came up with this, man, if he really understood the entire history behind where that came from, then what would he come up with? That's my only mm -hmm. issue about it. I know some kids get into the music, they get into it from point D and they just stay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My thing is, no, be a historian. Mm -hmm. You know, go back and do the work because anything can inform what you do today. You know, I was shocked when I talked about some young music, I talked to, some young musicians, and they, they didn't know who other report was. Hmm. Like, that blew my mind. And you know, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's stop the train. Uh, you know, <laughs> I pull up my phone, I say, sit down, we're gonna have a listening <laughs> session right now. But to me, that, that uh, weather report is the reason why you have a Pat Metheny, mm -hmm. you know, and other things like that. So if you, uh, you start to understand where all of those things, how all of those things evolved over the course of time, 
then you can sit down and say, you know what, man, but I like what those guys did, but I think I can do that a different way. I'm always telling my students, just don't cut yourself short. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all. And I understand, you know, being a younger musician coming into, there is a plethora of things to study. Mm. It's, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it is. I get it, you know. But that's why it's a lifelong process and journey. You know, I've been, I've, I've been writing operas and I just had a concerto that was performed. So I'm even going back and, and listening to Puccini, hmm. you know, and listening to Puccini is informing what I want to do with my band, mm -hmm. you know? And, and the thing about it, you can't trip about it. Cause I know sometimes as artists, we trip like, man, how come, how come I didn't learn about this <laughs> back when, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can't trip out about it because you come to things in the time that you're supposed to come to them. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just have to relax. But my thing is just don't become complacent. Mm -hmm. That's all. Just constantly mm -hmm. keep moving. Yeah. Right. Well, you also mentioned something about um, how art is transportive. One thing that all three of you have in common also is you've all been really deeply involved with music that speaks to contemporary social political issues. You know, um, Keon, on, on your uh, recent music, like you've, you've created stuff that speaks to the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. um, sometimes involving spoken word, sometimes just with song titles. Mm -hmm. um, Terrence, obviously the, the E Collective has been all about that. Mm -hmm. and, and Camila, in your songs, and then also with Ryan Keverly's project, um, which deals with sort of the political, you know, our political hot mess. Um, you know, so all of you have been engaging with stuff that's right now, you know, mm -hmm. and really urgent. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if any of you can speak to how, you know, because obviously jazz musicians have been doing this over the years, but how is this moment different? And, and how do the tools at your disposal now uh, make it so? I don't, I don't know how different it is, you know, I, I, in terms of our uh, reaction. To things obviously the issues are different but um, it gets to a point being a musician where a C major chord takes on a whole new life because when you first learn it you learn it as a theoretical exercise it's a C major chord but when you get to a certain point in your life when these things start to affect you that becomes an emotion that becomes a color, it becomes a moment in time. And you can use it in such a way where people will go, damn, what was that chord? And they go, shit, it was just a C major chord. You know what I mean? Yeah. I actually had that experience with Wayne Shorter, stealing some of his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's how it was used in, in context. So I, 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 I think what happens is that, at least I can speak for myself, what happens is that you get to a point, man, where you're not trying to play that you can prove that you can play Cherokee. You're not trying to prove that you can play mm. Giant Steps or any of those things like, like that. You become moved by what it is you see in the news happening every day, the injustice, where people don't get a chance to have a voice. And you have this little bitty corner of the world where people can listen to what it is that you do. And you say, well, you know what? If I got this little bitty corner in this vast thing, I'm going to make damn sure that this corner is talking about something significant. Mm -hmm. Because who gives a shit about Giant Steps? No mm -hmm. disrespect to John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. but you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But in the long run, who cares? When innocent black people are being shot, people of color are being killed, and there's no repercussions for it, you know? You start to feel like I'm human just like anybody else. You know, uh, you start to feel like somebody has to say something. When Katrina happened, Spike came to, he, you know, we were live, I was in uh, LA and he came out to work with me. And he didn't, when he walked into my apartment, he didn't even say hi, man. He walked in and he said, I'm gonna do a documentary on those levees, I'm gonna give those people a chance to speak. I'm going to give those people a chance to tell their story, right? So as artists, we can do that, but we also can give our impressions about what's going on. And here's the crazy part about it. You never know who you're touching. Mm. 
-hmm. You'd never, man, when we did this last album live, we went to three cities where we had tragedies. We went to uh, Minneapolis where Philando was killed. We went to Cleveland where Tamir was killed. And then we went to Dallas where the cops were shot because it's really about gun violence. That's what we're trying to deal with. You know, and I don't care who's getting shot, it's gun violence, right? So while we're in Cleveland, this guy comes up to me, man, and you know, automatically I got the electric band now, so I'm, I've been automatically been having these arguments with people about what did you, why'd you give up your jazz band? You know, mm -hmm. what I, mean? I, get, I get that a lot. And this guy walked up to me and I could just, I figured I was about to have one of these arguments. You know, he goes, man, I thought you were gonna play A Tale of God's Will. And I'm like, oh shit, here we go, you know? And then he said, but when you started playing, you sounded so angry. And then he said, but then you told us what the music was about. And then he said something that blew my mind. He said, then I thought, well, if the guy who created Tale of God's Will was this angry about this topic, I need to rethink my position on gun control. Hmm. Now, if I could do that for one person, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if I'm doing it, she's doing it, he's doing it, we... We, we have, you know, uh, what's the word? Not unknowingly, but uh, unexpectedly have become like the conscience of our, of, of our society. Mm -hmm. And along with doing that, there's a responsibility to speak in your truth. Because it is about trying to change some hearts and minds when lives are on, uh, you know, at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Second, all of it. <laughs> Second, all of it. Um, um, for me, I feel like also very early on, um, there was this realization that my music is one thing with my life. You know, it's not separate. Right. Like I, I live through my music. My music is living through me, and so everything that I am and everything that I am experiencing as a human being will eventually hopefully come out, you know, in a certain way, in a certain expression that will, um, you know, tell this story with the hopes that, <clears throat> you know, get resonates with someone and we both can go through this emotion, you know, and eventually heal. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, there's something about music um, that also has always resonated. The fact that like going through this experience together it does transform us, you know? And so when you do, um, when you, you're not uh, limiting yourself, you know, to, to put out certain thoughts, certain ideas, certain hopes uh, for the audience and your, uh, to, to experience with you, you are being honest and, you, and we are growing together. Mm -hmm. So that's like a really, when it comes to a political issue, political, and this has been said years ago, but everything is political, <laughs> you know? And mm. we can experience it today. Everything that we do, everything you go out and everything really is a political decision. Yeah. So when, when we put, particularly in moments like this, when, if we are silent or if we are blind, to certain things, we're allowing them to happen. So we have a, a definitely a power as musicians because we're messengers, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's really important today. You all have your like hardcore jazz fans, you know, like the people who give you grief about the e-collective. Mm -hmm. But you also have other fans, mm -hmm. and you've got people who have come to your music through an entirely different, you know, side door. Um, you know, 
Keon, I've seen you on stage with Maxwell, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I wonder if you can talk about the experience of encountering listeners who are like, man, I, yeah, I really, I'm really into your stuff. Like, I don't know about jazz, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? Honestly, I've literally yeah. had several, several incidents where people come to me and they say, you know what? I don't know about jazz because it's kind of intimidating. You know, it's very cerebral. You know, I hear people playing and it's almost like they're masturbating to my ears. They, they're not really letting me be a part of it. They're, you know, their eyes are closed. They're not, they're not really sharing with me. But what you do brings me in. Mm -hmm. um, what you do, the way you hear it, if that's what jazz is, that's what I want to be about. Mm -hmm. I want to know about that kind of jazz. How did you get to that? And it is you know, kind of almost like a surreal experience because I don't want to be the person be like, well, you know, I shared it. I, I put in my times on my two five ones, but, <laughs> but you know right. what? There's a certain level that, you know what, forget that. It's about how we touching these people, how we raising their vibrations, you know? And if that, as an artist, our job is to paint the times and to paint, you know, these feelings that most people can't say. Um, we get a chance to be on stage and have that power to actually um, manipulate you know, what maybe what they believe or to give them another perspective that they didn't have, you know, I don't take that for granted and I'm happy that people are really, you know, latching on to that, really. You know, you know, I love to hear that because I'm gonna tell you, the thing, my big frustration is that I think what young jazz musicians forget a lot mm -hmm. is that, man, Duke Ellington said it. It's only two kinds of music, good and bad. Good and bad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And what young musicians have forgotten a lot is that I don't care if it's a pop act, a rock and roll act, or whatever, those people are being honest. Mm -hmm. They're being honest, right? Jazz are they, musicians- Are they always being honest? Well, I mean, the, the great <laughs> ones, I think the great yeah. ones are. I think the ones that have lasting power are. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always gonna be the moment in time, the flavor of the month kind of mm -hmm. thing. But I, but I, but but the the ones that I I guess the ones who have a message right they have a message that that, that really make you think something and feel something, and I think sometimes young jazz artists mm -hmm. get too consumed with the history, mm -hmm. you know, and get too consumed with being competitive mm -hmm. about being able to play your instrument at a certain level, being able to play this and being able to do that, and missing the big message, like, you know. Nobody wanted to be able to play Clifford Brown solo on Cherokee more than me, <laughs> right? And I learned it and practiced the hell out of it. But I could never breathe life into it the way Clifford did when he played it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I had to realize was me studying it was an intellectual exercise to push me in a whole nother direction, not to replicate that. Mm -hmm. It was a means to understand what is possible with these notes of this chromatic scale that we use, period. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, 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 you said something earlier about listening to all of the trumpet players, and one of the things I wanted to tell you was, my mentor in the film business, man, when I wanted him to give me lessons, you know, he heard my score to Malcolm X and he wouldn't. And I got upset with him. I'm like, mm -hmm. man, why? He said, no, he says, and he told me something, he said, your weaknesses are your strengths. And when he told me that, it took me a minute to figure it out. But when I got to it, I went, that's why Miles Davis didn't play like Fast Navarro. Mm -hmm. That's why Wayne Shorter doesn't play like Sonny Rollins. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And who's to say, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're both great musicians. They all have something to offer. So the point being to me is that the burning desire inside to speak truth is what creates all of this music. That's what creates it. Because, I, you know, I think about jazz musicians and I think about this music a lot. One of the things, I've been working in this classical world right now, present with the concerto, and I've been hanging in that world and it's, and it's a beautiful thing to experience. But one of the things that it's made me really aware of is how jazz musicians are working on two levels because you want to master your instrument at the same time there's a burning desire to say something mm -hmm. right so this desire sometimes can be can outweigh your technique mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? Because you know what it is inside you want to say. But the beautiful thing about it is when you allow it to express itself, uniqueness mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. And the thing you said about breathing life mm -hmm. and, and the, the difference between the life that that, that thing had in the moment yeah. and the intellectual exercise. Right. Um, I want to make, I want to sort of bridge this to listeners mm -hmm. because I think that same lesson is valuable for non-practicing oh, players. Definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My own experience is, is, you know, I began really delving into this music right around the time you were beginning to release albums with Donald Harrison. Oh, wow. Um, okay. You know, yeah. wearing your suits and, and yeah. you know, playing that, <laughs> yeah. playing with Ralph yeah. Peterson and, right. you know, doing that thing. And, and th the historical thing was so powerful, as you said, mm -hmm. um, that I spent the, the first part of my jazz listening experience like being mad that I wasn't born in time <laughs> to be around at the five spot in 1960 <laughs> right. or at Minton's in right. you know right. 1941 or whatever right. it was. Right. Um, and I carried that for a while. Right. And I think a lot of jazz listeners, um, they plug into how amazing this moment was in time. And right. they think, well, to live in that moment, mm -hmm. what would that be like? Right. And it took me a little while to wake up and say, like, you can love that. Mm -hmm. You can revere it and honor it but don't be blind to the thing that's happening like all around you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to a large extent, that's, that's what this book is, yes. right? It's me sort mm -hmm. of bearing witness to mm -hmm. what I've been fortunate enough to see mm -hmm. um, and try to fit it into a context. Mm -hmm. But I've always loved that about you, dude. You're one of the few who do that. And you know that, <laughs> <laughs> you know that, right? Because, 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 no, it's, and, and I'm not trying to pump him up, but I'm just being real. Because that's been one of the big problems in jazz. The, one of the big problems in jazz is that, you know, I've, I've started seeing this when people say, oh, man, man, you got to go check out so-and-so, man. He plays just like Sonny Rollins. Hmm. And then you hang out with Stanley Tarantine. He tells you a story of, man, I remember, man, hanging out with so-and-so. We went down into a club, and the dude was playing just like Sonny Rollins, so we left. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they are, they are talking about the life force that exists in the music. You know, there was, there was a group called Air years ago, man. I used to go hear them at the, at, the, at the Vanguard. I used to love to hear Air all the time. It was just a trio. And one of the things that I used to love about them was they were just doing what they did. And, and, and you could feel something from it. There's a, there's a, there's a people get, they think I'm crazy, but there's a, there's a group in LA, they play at the Dresden, uh, Marty and Elaine. Right? Mm. Right? Marty and they're, Elaine. They're in Swingers. They're in they, the movie Swingers. They're in the movie Swingers, yeah. right. And Marty and Elaine, they just play show tunes all night long. And sometimes they'll play some Prince, and then Elaine, she plays the keyboard, and she'll play a synth solo, whatever. And people say, man, why do you enjoy that? And I go, because they are having fun playing music. Hmm. And it comes across. Hmm. Is it something that I would do? No. But <laughs> who cares? They are having fun, and people are getting something from it, and I think that's the most important thing about any art, mm -hmm. you know? People want to quantify or qualify it or whatever, and to me, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, because that's just you, you know, with this, in, going through this intellectual exercise trying to mm -hmm. prove how much you know mm -hmm. about art, when you really don't know anything about it if you're not recognizing the fact that people are, like you're saying, being healed by listening to Marty and Elaine.